Hello. This is the first time I've done a speech, and it's much better to stay behind the camera. So wish me luck. I'm going to lift this up here. So in 2017, on November 12th, I landed at Heathrow Airport after spending three weeks in one of the most hospitable and generous countries I've visited. Upon arriving at immigration, I discovered airport police were waiting for me. I was guided into a private room, sat down, and looked up to see three officers with faces of concern. Are you safe? They asked me. We were notified you'd landed from Baghdad. I had just arrived in London after walking the Arbaean pilgrimage, the world's largest annual pilgrimage in Iraq, for the first time. Perhaps I was the only foreigner on that flight, or perhaps there was something going on I didn't know about. Either way, the sight of someone like me returning from Iraq had officers concerned for my safety. When I was invited to walk Arbaeen, it was out of the blue and only two weeks before the pilgrimage, but I felt compelled to say yes. I accepted for a multitude of reasons, but more than anything, I believe strongly that there was surely more to Iraq than conflict. By accepting the invitation, I was fighting against all my senses after growing up in the UK and only seeing a war-torn Iraq in the media. I was anxious, 24 at the time, not Muslim, white middle class, from Surrey. I'd never visited the Middle East before, had not met a Muslim until I was 16, and my family's experience of the Middle East extends to Lebanese wine. I'm a photojournalist, and up to this point in 2017, I had been working for three years, documenting stories focusing on female empowerment, human rights, and the environment. I became increasingly aware over those years of those who profited from pandering to the fears of the general public, particularly in the West. I noticed the shades of gray, the inherent bias, and at times, the blatant lies. I noticed the more I traveled, and the more I questioned, the smaller the world felt. And as I moved through it, but parallel to that, how infinitely large it can be. When I started this career, I was advised by several journalists that to get attention and be successful, I would have to cover conflict in the Middle East. I was advised to invest in the very narrative that I now defiantly fight against. I accepted to walk Arbaeen as it was the most positive, peaceful story about a misunderstood religion in a country and region that had been historically reported negatively and in at a time of increasing hate crime towards Muslims. I couldn't help but question how as many as 25 million pilgrims walked to Kabbalah over the course of 40 days in mourning for a man who died 1400 years ago and it wasn't worthy of global attention. I also thought if this many people were walking and safe, then I would have to trust I would too. As I researched Arbaeen from home, the only story I could see was coverage from a suicide bombing in 2016, and even now, Arbaeen is almost unreported in the West. And so there I was at Najaf Airport with a team of Iranian and Iraqi filmmakers preparing to make a documentary on Arbaeen to capture the attention of a wider non-Muslim audience. For three weeks, we walked Arbaeen via the quiet, quiet pathways in Hilla, along the Euphrates River, and towards the heart of Karbala via what pilgrims fondly call the Highway of Love. I was moved by the compassion I personally encountered, and also between pilgrim to pilgrim, many of whom had flown from the US and Asia and UK. I was surprised to meet a woman who worked for HSBC in London, and she explained to me that the last thing her office workers said to her before leaving for the spiritual journey was, don't die. Instead, we found ourselves in Hilla, discussing the lack of independent coffee shops in London, while meandering our way through these date palm forests towards our accommodation for the night. I've been informed that if you stay in the men's mocabs, you'll experience a strong symphony of snoring. But I can tell you in the women's mocabs, you have to be prepared for toddlers poking you awake and the sound of newborn babies crying. And in my case, I had aunties offering me food, readjusting my hijab, 
and asking me 20 times a day if I was married. <laughs> Everyone was there for the same reason, to pay respects to Imam Hussein. And yet we were all on different journeys. While I'm not Muslim, I found the message of Arba'in at an enormously transitional point in my life. And I found many pilgrims had decided to walk Arba'in after losing a loved one or fleeing conflict. Those who had waited much of their life to be there in their 80s and 90s. And I also learned that in 2017 and 2018, more women than men walked Arba'in. When we reached Imam Hussein's shrine the day before Arba'in, I stood on a rooftop looking out at a stream of pilgrims arriving in the city and at my colleagues knelt on the floor weeping in the presence of Imam Hussein's shrine. I felt overwhelmed and confused. How could up to 25 million people walk in peace every year and no one know about it? How could they mourn for Hussein as if he had just died that day? And how could one man unify so many people in one place and yet so, flu so few globally know about it. This is something I continue to reflect on in Iraq as we finish filming and when I return back to the UK. I spent 2018 deeply frustrated by the contrast between my experiences and what the British media spouted. Two weeks before Arbaeen in 2018, I contacted my friend Farzan and I asked if we could walk it again. This time, we were without a documentary film crew. I wasn't sharing a polished film, but rather videos of everyday encounters shot on iPhone with pilgrims and locals as we shared food and tea experiences and company. While Arbaeen is no doubt a time of deep mourning, there is so much joy to be found too. In the most sensitive and raw of times, we can, as people, be softer than ever, and that is certainly the case for Arbaeen. Social media is a tool that's neglected, but here I'd found a space to show people how I experienced Iraq and how peaceful Islam is. It wasn't enough to tell people, I had to show them, and Instagram became that medium. On the day of Arbaeen, I was presented with a press card and invited alongside multiple local and international journalists, albeit all male, to photograph from the roof of Imam Hussein's shrine. The videos I shared subsequently went viral, which is the reason why I'm standing here today, and with that, a tide of positive and negative feedback. But what these videos confirmed was that positive, non-sensationalized news about human connection could go viral, that there was a want and a need for storytelling from the Middle East and Muslims that wasn't just conflict and terrorism. And yet, when I contacted media outlets, the story was declined because it simply wasn't of interest, our type of story, or in one instance, in response to my pitch of a walk of peace, the editor explained they cover travel and culture, not politics. Instead, I made sure these photographs traveled as far as possible. I included them in a church in Italy, a 3,000 person capacity convention in Israel, like galleries in the US, and as of May in front of the UN and world leaders during the Global Disarmament Conference in Dublin Castle. I didn't stop there. Compelled by the story of Hussein, I, since 2018, I have documented Muslim communities in the US and UK. Kashmir and Uttar Pradesh in India, Afghanistan, Iran, Kurdistan region of Iraq, and Lebanon to show another reality of life in these countries and the experiences of those who live there. I find it immensely problematic that it required a non-Muslim white woman to bring attention to the world's largest pilgrimage. It exacerbated the privilege that I held and I realized how much more inclined people were to listen to me than Muslims. There are steps white people can make, and the first is to recognize our privilege. Staying out of politics and not lending our support as allies to Muslims is privilege in action. The color of my skin and religion 
will likely not make me a target of bigotry, attacks, deportation, or genocide. If your life is not at stake, you'll feel less inclined to engage, and in doing so, you are complicit. From birth, I have been granted privilege, and with that, I will use it responsibly. And to be an ally for Muslims, and indeed any community. Since walking our Bayin, I have learned how best to use my voice, with the support and the advice from Muslim colleagues and friends, many of whom are in this room. I can lend my voice to make a difference, while making space for the voices of Muslims. When the men at Heathrow Immigration asked me if I was safe, I told them, very simply, that the very reason they wanted to interview me was the very reason I had gone to Iraq, to show people it's not what they think it is. I opened my laptop and I showed them my photographs. I believe they're being exhibited somewhere in this building. And I showed them these pictures from the pilgrimage. They started to ask me about Shia Islam and what Iraq was like. And in that moment, three non-Muslim male police officers apologized for making the assumption that I was in danger simply because I'd been in Iraq. I left that, I left that room feeling like I had in the briefest of moments, use my privilege to provide the men with the tools to question. They wanted to know, they just didn't know what to ask. Many of us don't have the courage to ask the questions, and many of us will bypass this requirement and come to our own conclusions about people and communities. And likewise, it isn't the responsibility of Muslims to educate non-Muslims, but I'm hopeful that those with privilege like myself, can not only support Muslims, but also encourage non-Muslims to engage in activism. Journalism has the power to bring about change, to shift perspective, to empower. It always has and it always will. And the choice is how we use it. We must collectively stand up on the right side of history to never be silent bystanders and to stand up against injustice just as Imam Hussein did 1,400 years ago. There's no more important message in my life to share than this. And thank you, Imam Hussein Summit, for inviting me here today.